Hi, everyone. My name is Lori Peek, and I serve as the director of the Natural Hazard Center in the Institute of Behavioral Science here at the University of Colorado Boulder. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the monthly Making Mitigation Work webinar series, which is hosted by the Natural Hazard Center and made possible with the support of the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the National Science Foundation. This webinar series highlights recent progress in mitigation policy, practice, and research. We are so grateful that you have made the time to join with us today for this presentation on advancing racial and social equity through natural hazards mitigation. We are living in an extended state of emergency. And with the convergence of the COVID-19 pandemic, a rapidly warming climate, rising hazards losses, and uprisings for social and racial justice, communities of color and low-income people have been disproportionately impacted. This webinar will help us see these crises and what we can do about them through a racial equity lens. Thank you for being here. A few announcements before we begin the formal webinar presentation. This forum is being recorded. The captioned video recording and presentation slides from today's webinar will be posted online at the Natural Hazard Center's website at hazards.colorado.edu. This is also where you can find the recordings and supplemental materials from the prior Making Mitigation Work webinars, as well as access many other free resources. Thanks to a partnership with the International Association of Emergency Managers, we can offer one contact hour of emergency management training through the IAEM certification program. To receive the credit, you are required to attend the entire webinar session today. Please visit the Making Mitigation Work webpage under the Trainings tab at hazards.colorado.edu for more information. You can also contact Katie Murphy at hasctr at colorado.edu for more information on receiving your certificate. If at any point during the presentation today, you have questions or comments, you can offer those either via the chat function or the Q&A box on Zoom. We'll be monitoring both places and our wonderful speaker today has left plenty of time to respond to questions during today's webinar and to be in dialogue with you. Now, without further ado, I am honored to introduce today's speaker, Alan Kwok. Alan serves as a director of Disaster Resilience for Philanthropy California and Northern California grant makers. Philanthropy California involves an alliance of over 600 philanthropic organizations and groups across the state of California. His role is to strengthen and galvanize the philanthropic sector in California around investments in community-based climate and disaster resilience. In partnership with the state of California, and I know we have several Californians signed up for this webinar today, he leads Philanthropy California's efforts to support disaster response and recover for local as well as statewide disasters, including the 2018 and 19 wildfires and the current and ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. I also know that many of you who are on the webinar today have played a role in mitigating and responding to these various crises. And so I hope you will save some questions for Alan about that as well. Um, before joining Philanthropy California, Alan spent nearly 20 years in various social and humanitarian sectors. Uh, he managed a FEMA award-winning community resilience initiative in the San Francisco Bay Area at the American Red Cross. And in 2008, Alan somehow found time to earn his PhD in emergency management at Massey University in Wellington, uh, New Zealand. I could go on and on about not just Alan's professional and academic credentials, but what a fine human being he is. But instead of me saying that, I'm gonna turn this over to him so that he can share his knowledge, wisdom, and quest for justice with all of us. Alan, over to you and thank you for being with us today. 
Lori and team um, at the Natural Hazard Center um, and Katie in the background, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, what a pleasure. Um, this is a topic that we are struggling through, through you know, we are still learning. So um, I'm so grateful to all of you who have signed up and joining us this morning or in the afternoon or whatever time zone you are at um, around this topic. Um, I hope to learn as much as you learn from me as I do from you. Um, and um, in the last part of my um, presentation, I will be crowdsourcing some information, uh, hopefully that you can help um, educate me and the work that we do here in the philanthropy. So I am going to um, just really start off with um, the, the, what I do. Um, so as Laurie said, I work for um, Philanthropy California, uh, which is, now, because of COVID-19, we have increased the number of uh, members that we have. We are an alliance of three different nonprofit membership-based associations working to support our philanthropic members um, to make sure that their philanthropic dollars are strategically invested across a whole range of issues, whether that will be education, criminal justice, gender justice, healthcare, or disaster or climate change resilience. We, um, out of all of these 700 plus grant making institutions and individuals, they grant out over $9 billion um, annually. And our role as a philanthropic supporting organization is just to ensure that they are, the monies that is going out are coordinated and that they are in alignment and in coordination with other sectors. And we also serve as a, um, as a, I would say, clearinghouse, or we represent our members to um, advocate for equitable policies on a range of issues, whether they'll be social justice, education, or disaster, or climate change. So our role in uh, California, we serve California, uh, we support our California-based funders. We also um, um, a part of a bigger disaster management ecosystem within the state of California. And in disaster response, we serve and support the state of California in the emergency services function 17, which is donations and volunteer management. We are a clearinghouse for all of the different um, intermediary funds that are supporting direct relief to disasters, as well as to recovery and mitigation and preparedness. For us as a organization, we also um, support our members, you know, through sharing information, how they can best invest their dollars. We publicize all of the different information where they can donate their money. Uh, we connect our philanthropic members and institutions to government agencies, both at the local, state, as well as the federal level. And we also connect them to frontline community organizations and nonprofits that are at the front line in responding to all of the different crises that we are experiencing right now this year. As I said before, we advocate on behalf of our members on policies and legislations that really support our most vulnerable communities. So here in California, we have just come out from yet another destructive wildfire season. And before I actually go on to talk about California, I am going to have Katie actually do a number of posts so that I can kind of like somehow tailor my presentation on the fly around what, um, you know, um, so that, you know, what I'm going to share with you can resonate with you. So Katie, there are seven questions that we are going to do on the poll and I am going to have Katie pop up. The first question is, who are you? And um, Katie said that you are supposed to have 30 seconds or less to fill out the, the, um, the poll. So if you can kindly press on the, um, the vote button and then we will see where you're from. We have quite a bit of uh, from academic institution as well as uh, from the government sector. Thank you. And the next poll, just we just wanted to see where you are, um, where you are zooming in or calling in from.
Great. And most of you are definitely from the U.S. Um, for those of you outside of the U.S., I may not, you know, um, I may not talk much about the, the global um, um, context, but hopefully what I'm going to share with you can apply to where you are uh, located. And next, um, next poll. The next poll is really just for me to understand, you know, what kind of natural hazards that you are dealing with. Uh, whether they'll be in your studies or the work that you do and the um, communities that you're serving. Great, a lot of floods and many of you are also dealing with fires. Great. And typhoon or hurricanes, fantastic. And the next one is really focusing on the type of work that you do um, within the quote unquote disaster cycle or disaster continuum, uh, whether it will be mitigation preparedness or response or recovery. And fantastic, great. Um, not surprising, <laughs> many of you are doing uh, mitigation work. Uh, so you're in the right webinar. Um, and the next um, two questions we really focus on, um, since this uh, conversation is really around um, racial justice and economic just, uh, justice uh, issues, just really thinking about to what extent is the factor race or ethnicity is integrated into the work or studies that you do. Fully integrated, that means is everything that you do, you have to consider race or ethnicity. Mostly integrated, that means most of the time you, you consider race and ethnicity to what you do or study. Okay, so there is an probably quite, quite an even number of um, uh, in responses. So some of you, you know, are fully integrated. We have equal number in terms of mostly or somewhat or limited integrations. Great. And the next question is really looking into income and wealth. How does income or wealth as a factor play into the work that you do? And great. Yep, very similar to the previous ones, um, but less so for uh, fully integration. And then lastly, um, why are you here? <laughs> um, so why is, um, so for, if you are considering race or ethnicity or income or wealth of people into the work that you do, because are you interested in it or because you are required to do it? So it seems the majority of you are just interested in the intersection of disaster resilience and you know um, racial and social equity. And a small number of you um, is part of your organizational policy or you know uh, work. And so those are the key uh, polls and I'm gonna share with you where I come from. So as I said before, Philanthropy California, we look in all phases of a disaster and thank you Katie for um, doing the polls. In Philanthropy California, we look at all phases of disasters, including climate. Um, and for us is everything that we touch at the work that we do, we have to take on a racial equity lens. And I'm gonna share with you what that means. And so because of, we just come out from a wildfire season and now we are on top of COVID-19, you have the uprising for, you know, because of the racial injustices that we are seeing um, and Many parts of the countries are also experiencing hurricanes, tornadoes. You know, we have these compounding disasters that are happening. And we know all of these different uh, crises are affecting people of color the most. Great. So when I talk about, you know, so what we're trying to do right here, you know, hopefully in this conversation and, you know, in, is trying to see how we can strive towards a more racially equitable society. And by that is in which the distribution of resources access to opportunities 
or you know having the societal burdens are not determined or predictable by race. So that means is everyone, regardless of the skin color, will have the same access to opportunities and resources. But we know that the reality is not what it seems like. Race still matters in everything that we do here in the US. Whether if you are, you know, race matters because it kind of predict your health outcomes, your educational levels, your income or your wealth accumulation, accumulation, how long you might live, you know, whether you're likely to be jailed or not, as well as hazard vulnerability. So before I go on, there's a difference between equality and equity. So this is a quick definition check, is when I talk about equity, I'm not talking about equality. Equality is based on the fundamental assumption that we are all starting from the same place. But we know that in the reality is that certain segments of the population, especially because of the skin color, have more access to more opportunities and resources. So if we take on a equality approach to our resource distribution, everyone will get the same thing. But then we are still, you know, uh, we are still not really solving the disparities because not everybody is coming from the same place. But we take on an equity approach. We consider people's based on their past history, the current situations, then that we can distribute our resources much more equitably so that everyone can enjoy you know, the opportunities that is afforded to them in the society. So equity is basically thinking about how can we providing different approaches to engagement and resources by understanding that different people have different needs and that practices, programs, or policies need to ensure culturally responsive to access and opportunity. Therefore, equity is not about treating everyone or giving everybody the same thing. It is very different and tailored and that, you know, um, different policies, programs should not be aimed at a certain group, but should be aimed at understanding how different groups based on the cultural or racial ethnicities will be, you know, will be different. So in disaster contexts, we know this um, um, equality or equity approaches come into play constantly, especially in disaster relief. So in case of a wildfire, you know, if you take on an equality approach, every person who is impacted by wildfire or hurricane will receive $500 in emergency cash aid. Doesn't matter who you are. But an equity approach is some people will receive more money because of their income level, whether they are rental or home ownership status and family situations and et cetera. So it is a very different type of a approach to delivering and uh, distributing resources. So for us here in Philanthropy California, we take on an equity approach in that we do not see everybody as the same size fit all program. Certain populations will need to get provide more resources because they are coming from a different place. So here are three questions that I'm gonna repeat them over and over again as to what I mean by racial equity lens. So it's kind of like take a moment to think about that, the work that you do. Think about how are existing racial disparities are standing in the way of the goals that you want to fulfill whether that will be implementing a program in your community or doing research in a specific community. Then after you ask that question, what do you see as the forces behind these disparities? Why do these disparities exist? And then look into what are these forces or other forces are perpetuating these disparities? And I think these are the questions that we constantly ask ourselves here to think about how our money distributed in a way that perpetuate or advance racial and economic equities. So as, I, as uh, Laurie said in the beginning, these are the outlines of, um, of my webinar. And I'm for the next probably 20 or 30 slides, I'm gonna pass through them quite quickly. So I can leave um, about 20 minutes for q and I'm gonna talk about why disasters and disaster aid programs exacerbate racial and economic inequities, why we need to start figuring out and emphasizing mitigation and preparedness as a way to advance racial equity, the importance of multi-sector partnerships in unlocking financial resources for the benefit of people of and communities of color. 
and the types of investment that I think we need to support racial equity and disaster resilience. So as I said, the context that we're in, we are in the context of global warming, you know, changing climate. Um, we are into, you know, a context of advancing, trying to amplify, you know, the inequities that we see racially. We have COVID-19, but all of these different grassroots actions that we are seeing from the communities are really there to, to seek a more racially equitable and healthy society. And given that climate change will be with us for decades to come, we are seeing climate change is changing the character of many of the natural hazards that we see in our communities, including more frequent or intense heat waves, rainfalls from hurricanes, as well as drought and wildfires. And in 2020, we already experienced a number of billion dollar weather or climate disasters here in the US. And in the last 20 years, out of the last 20 years, we see significant, the frequency of these billion dollar disasters kind of kept rising in, you know, so that the last five years, we are seeing, you know, more frequent um, billion dollar disasters than we did in the last 20 years. And we are seeing that these billion dollar disasters, of course, cost more. And in 2020 alone, and this graph is yet to um, represent and reflect the wildfires that we see in California, Oregon, and Washington, as well as the droughts and heat waves and the hurricanes we see in, in the Southwest, uh, Southeast. And we also know, because I come from California, so a little bit biased towards one hazard, um, we see that climate change is a major driver for Western wildfires compared to, so the light blue is acres burnt without climate change. And then if we add on to climate change, we are seeing additional acres burn. And we know that the number of wildfires we are increasing here in the Western California, they're burning more land and they're costing more to, to fight. But all of these different natural hazards have been with us for millennial. But then the disasters that result from natural hazard events are created not by nature, but the policies and the decisions that we make. And therefore here in Philanthropy California, we forbid everyone to use the phrase natural disasters. Because if we use the phrase natural disasters, we fail to consider the power, the oppression, inequity, and injustice embedded in all of the decisions that are being made that have put vulnerable people, especially black and brown communities, into harm's way. So this is a, um, a um, a quote from a blog from Jason and Ksenia um, that was posted on the Natural Hazard Center, I think a few months ago. Um, this is a great blog around, you know, framing around disasters and disaster discourses. And when I say, why, why are all these decisions that are happening? Why, you know, why are we putting, you know, the decision, why human beings or, you know, human organizations are creating disasters? It's because of many different policies and different decisions that we make to put people in vulnerable, pop, in vulnerable uh, um, situations. And I would say the last four years has been a little bit devastating for many of the frontline, frontline communities in, in face of climate and environmental, environmental issues. So in the last four years, more than 70 plus environmental rules and regulations that govern clean air, water, toxic chemicals have been either reversed revoked or rolled back. An additional 27 are being rolled back as of now. And they, you know, they relate to carbon emissions from power plants or vehicles to the removal of protections of wetlands, uh, limits on, you know, mercury emissions and etc. And all of these have impacts not only on the ecological health of our planet, but they actually impact disproportionately on those who are black and brown communities. And black and brown communities, as I said, they are more exposed to hazard vulnerability, including air pollution. And this is a graph from um, our state, um, state pollution um, website, where the red means, you know, communities are much more exposed to air pollution. And the, I would say the more intense the color, that means red or orange, though, so, you know, you see that they are more likely to be, um, um, they have higher percentages of communities of colors and household of colors. And I think I'm gonna to point to one policy that continues to have a 
profound impact on um, on black and brown communities as we are facing both different types of natural hazards, especially climate, those related to climate. Redlining, um, if you are not aware, hopefully everybody knows it. If not, redlining is a federal policy that was in place back in the 1930s that rate neighborhoods as to either good or bad. Um, simply because of bad means, you know, like simply because um, of higher number of Af African Americans and immigrants living in these neighborhoods. So that, you know, this policy basically kind of decide who can get federally backed mortgage, uh, mortgages and other credits. And so if you live in a bad neighborhood, that means higher number of, um, I would say people of color, house of color, you are less likely to get a mortgage or other credits. And that continues to feel, even though redlining has been outlawed back in the 1960s, it has still continued to be felt to this day, 90 years from now. It's still being felt because it fuels the cycle of disinvestment in these communities. So for example, surface temperatures in redlined areas are approximately five degrees Fahrenheit warmer than non-redlined areas. For many cities around the US, we will see daily temperatures to continue to increase in frequency as climate change are going to make cities hotter in most places in the US. And so you're thinking about who will be most impacted by climate change by heat waves, especially those living in historically redlined communities. And then this is a documentary that this year is the 25th anniversary of the 1995 Chicago heat wave in which seven, over 700 folks um, died as a result of the heat waves and majority of them are black and they live in the poorest neighborhoods in the city. Yes, the heat killed them, but then it's also the structural racism as well as the lack of resources that put them in a vulnerable place. Those who are, you know, who suffered from the heat and died from the heat lack air conditioning. They live in places with higher rate of violence so that, you know, instead of going out and relieve, you know, and, and enjoy the cooler air, many people just kept inside because for fear of, you know, violence outside the neighborhoods. And then it also speaks to the inadequate response from local emergency departments. So that is one aspect of you know, vulnerability from one hazard. We also see societies put vulnerable populations in higher wildfire risk areas. So with that, so not only do people of color and communities of color are more exposed to and at risk of natural hazards, we are also seeing that they're more impacted by hazard events themselves. In terms of disasters, when a disaster happens, we see that federal aid or, you know, um, a lot of different aid do you favor those who are white and homeowners. And this is a little guide that I got from um, um, FEMA and it is a fantastic guide. Um, just to help, help those who have been impacted by a federally declared disaster to navigate different individual assistance. And then if you are going to look into, you know, like if you are starting from the beginning, beginning, if you have insurance, you will go through this process. And if you don't have insurance, you go through a little bit more complex process. It may sound easy to go through these processes, but there are many different social, sociocultural factors that um, prevent people from accessing these services or aid. And these include Many people may not trust the government, you know, in terms of their information or fear that, you know, they may get, you know, if you are an immigrant, whether you are legal immigrants or illegal immigrants, you may not want to give your information to a government because for fear of, you know, um, getting sent back home um, to their country. And if you're illegal immigrants, if the household, all of them are illegal immigrants, you kind of locked out from all federal aid. So, and then there's also um, social, social cultural variables like time constraints. Some people just don't have time to go through these processes. It is a complex process to apply for aid, especially if you're renters, you know, you may be holding multiple jobs. So where can you find time to get an appointment to, for an interview to get uh, aid? So there's also a language, you know, or perceived, whether perceived or real language, you know, um, um, 
um, barriers that may exist, as well as a whole host of factors. And for the next slides, I'm going to talk about why disasters. You know, the more disasters, the more racial inequity that we see, especially along income and wealth. And I'm going to kind of like cite the work by Junior Howe and James Elliott. If Junior Howe is on this um, call, I apologize to you. I am actually stealing all of your slides from a presentation that you have given us uh, last year. So these slides just basically talk about why disasters, how disasters perpetuate racial wealth gaps here in the US. And I'm gonna start off with education first. Um, based on her study, when all things are held equal except education level, those who are college educated actually gain wealth from a natural hazard event compared to someone with an fifth grade level. If you're a homeowner, on average, you also gain more wealth than if you're a renter, you're holding everything equal. But when you start looking into how race factors into these areas, using a very stereotypical comparison, someone who is white, college educated homeowner, compared to someone who is black, high school educated or renter, or a Latinx high school educated renter, you see significant differences in the wealth gap in that a white college educated homeowner actually gained an upward of $130,000 just from a natural hazard event, while Blacks lose an upward of $90,000 in wealth as a result of a natural hazard event. And now back to you, just about back to you without the education, without other factors, just because of your race, we see that white folks actually gain wealth compared to you blacks or Latinx. And that with FEMA aid, we know that FEMA aid is there to help, but we know that they are, the FEMA aid currently is at a set up, is not able to address the disparities that we are seeing. And this is finally, you know, like if you're looking into the 1999 to 2013, you know, wealth gap, you know, attributed to hazard, natural hazard damage, you see that on the screen, you know, how on the slide, you know, the disparities just because of a disaster. So what I'm, uh, what I'm saying is I'm not discrediting the need for federal disaster aid. I think it's important, but I do want to shine a light as to how we can improve a system through a racial equity lens, why it is not serving those who, are, who need it the most. And I think better still is like, how can we prevent disasters from happening to those who are most vulnerable, especially our black and brown communities, so that we are not further perpetuating racial inequities. So this last part is of my presentation is how should we invest? And I think simply put, we need to invest our dollars differently. And I, we always believe and always believe it's like an ounce of preparation is worth a pound of cure. And hopefully all of you can agree to that. There are two major sources of funding around mitigation. I think the biggest one is, of course, our fellow government. Fellow government and state government are key in, in supporting mitigation in our most vulnerable communities. If you're looking into this picture, the big rocks or boulders kind of represent the big chunks of dollars that fellow governments give out in mitigation assistance. Philanthropy here is really the sand between the rocks. Compared to the rocks, which is big chunk of money, but it is really hard to move them around. The sand, yes, we have so much more less money, you know, to play in mitigation assistance, but our dollars is much more malleable and flexible. We can go places where fellow dollars cannot go. So in the next few slides is I'm going to talk about you know, what we know and what the behaviors we are, you know, and where the money is going right now. What we know is we should be doing, but then the reality might be a little bit different. For example, we, I know many of you have seen this chart. We know that for every $1 invested in mitigation, we save $6. But we also know that mitigation assistance spending right now, majority of them is being, you know, allocated only after disaster. 
so that you know the way mitigation spending is structured really encourages mitigation spending following a natural hazard event so that the more you know disasters that we see the more spending is spent towards mitigation for me it's just a little bit illogical because why don't we just spend more money on mitigation before a natural hazard event and I would say philanthropy, we are not good as, as well. Um, I'm going to be very critical in my sector as well, is philanthropic dollars, especially when we have these CNN disasters or you know, disasters with high media attention, everyone start opening the checkbooks. And for the last few years, over nearly two thirds of funding from philanthropy, that will be individual philanthropy. That means you're, you know, you and me donating to, you know, uh, donating to a disaster, or an institutional foundation, or a institution or company. Two thirds of the funding addressed only in disaster relief. They actually don't do anything to solve any problems. They are just, you know, I would say, managing, you know, the problem. They are not changing the conditions, you know, in which people are put into vulnerable positions in the first place. They are not reducing any impacts of, you know, potential natural hazard events. They are just simply managing the problem. So philanthropy, we are at fault as well. And only 5% of current philanthropy dollars go into mitigation and preparedness. And with climate change, we know that in the global scheme of things, about five to nine billion dollars are being spent on climate mitigation. But that is only less than two percent of the global giving in the world. Only two percent. So there's so much we can do to invest in places that we think is important. And this is really around investing in mitigation and preparedness. We can move money more upstream so that we can prevent disasters. And in many senses, you know, if we prevent disasters, we do not perpetuate wealth disparities and racial disparities here in the US. So next is talking about, you know, the need for multi-sector partnerships, how we can do that. And I'll be closing my slides in the next five minutes. One is we need to leverage public private resources. Government money, there's so much more than philanthropy, but we can do so much good if we can do it together. For example, in California, when there is a risk for wildfires, usually, you know, hundreds of people lose power because our power companies just shut off power preemptively to reduce the risk of wildfires. As a result, many of the low income or local communities in many of the rural places lose power. So the California Public Utilities Commission from the state of California have set aside over $600 million to provide free batteries to low income communities you know, until 2024. But many of these dollars do not get advertised in communities. And many of these communities have no idea how to get the money. And additionally, additionally, for those organizations who is eligible to get the free power, they need to have, they need to put in money to apply for free power. They need to, you know, there's upfront cost to it. As a result, we have a member, Direct Relief, which is a, both a, you know, they serve both California nationally and internationally. They put in some money to support education and outreach to their network of health clinics that serve low-income communities. And they pay 5% to 5% application fee upfront so that they can start the process of getting alternative power for their clinics. And so at this moment, uh, 40 health organizations have already signed up to do that. And I think this is a really great model in terms of leveraging philanthropy dollars to get more public dollars. And this is very similar. So we are trying to figure out how can we use this model to get leverage, you know, more public dollars using philanth philanthropy. And we are thinking about with new building resilient infrastructure program and in communities, the BRIC program, there is a cost share element. Generally, there's a 25% cost share, whether there will be cash or in-kind services or materials. For those that are small and impoverished communities, there's a 10% cost share. Now we are thinking about how we can use philanthropic dollars to meet that cost share so that we can get more public dollars into our local communities. And there are three ways we are seeing that we can use philanthropic dollars to make our communities much more competitive to get this money. 
in the break of qualitative criteria. This is a criteria to, um, um, to evaluate an application. We see three areas. One is understanding whether a mitigation project impacts a population impacted. Who are the most vulnerable populations that are, you know, that where the project is proposed? Philanthropy can help support local governments in identifying and understanding who is in those communities most impacted by proposed mitigation projects. Two, outreach activities. Philanthropy dollars is really good in convening different stakeholders and creating outreach materials that can provide information to those who are most vulnerable. So there is also a, an avenue for philanthropy to come into play. And lastly is leveraging partners. The more partners that we can, you know, they can bring in whether, you know, um, academic institutions, philanthropic foundations, as well as governments, the stronger the application and the stronger the, the buy-in from the communities. So these are the three areas that we are going to start looking into in 2020 now, as well as in 2021, as to how we can work side by side with our state government to leverage these public dollars to improve our resiliency in our communities. And now for funders like you and me, both institutional or individual donors, we give, you know, hopefully all of you have given some money to our costs, including disasters. It's really thinking about resourcing grassroots communities and building their power. We know that black and brown communities are disproportionately impacted by disasters, but we also know that they care about climate change the most. Compared to the white counterparts, they are more alarmed and concerned about global warming than the white counterparts. Similarly, they are also more willing to engage in convincing elected officials to take action to address climate change issues. So here's my kind of my ask. If you are thinking about donating to your whatever cost, is really to support BIPOC-led organizations. That means Black, Indigenous, and people of color organizations. Many of these organizations do not fit into this disaster management ecosystem, but they have always been called upon to support their communities because of disasters. Unfortunately, many of these, you know, BIPOC-led organizations do not get the funding that we see in terms of philanthropic, so we call them the philanthropic redlining, is white-led nonprofits have budgets 25, you know, a quarter um, or 25 percent um, larger than those led by people of color. Nonprofits led by black women receive so much more less money than the black men or white women. Unrestricted assets, these are critical for the success of a nonprofit. Leaders of color you know, um, the unrestricted assets of nonprofits with leaders of color are 76% smaller than those led by whites, and those that improve the life of black men, and they're led by people of color are 91% smaller than those led by white leaders. So there is a lot of biases even in within the philanthropic sector in giving money to these frontline communities. The other thing is really supporting nonprofits that engage in advocacy. This is not only about advocating for policy, but this is really about organizing communities and supporting research and, you know, and, and educating legislators. What are the key issues that impact them the most? And again, I know that there is, uh, Kevin is on this call, I see um, him. So there's a study from Kevin uh, Jr. as well as James um, in disasters. We are looking into how philanthropy at a big scale can help support advocacy organizations. It is organizations that um, we really advocate on behalf of everybody in the communities. And we see that, you know, in their study, it shows that, you know, for communities, with high number of advocacy organizations, there it reduces um, racial um, wealth disparities in disasters compared to communities with low advocacy, um, low number of advocacy organizations. So you know, basically in this chart, basically you know, if it is going down, that means it's a good thing. So we, that, we see that communities with high number of advocacy organizations actually fare much better in terms of addressing the racial disparities. 
And we also see successes in California around, you know, um, advocacy, you know, that address climate change and supporting resource, you know, and helping to redirect resources to disadvantaged communities. Um, we see that in our cap and trade program in California because of advocacy of frontline communities. Now, a quarter of the cap and trade revenue goes directly back into disadvantaged communities. And also because of advocacy, now that since 2019, every county in California needs to integrate cultural competence in their emergency planning. That includes how they communicate emergency um, information, how they evacuate and shelter those with, you know, who are POC. Um, looking into mitigation and prevention planning for um, for culturally diverse groups and each county is also required to provide a forum for community engagement you know so that they can engage with culturally diverse communities and i just want to give a shout out to a number of organizations that are currently you know working in this front in terms of building community uh, power advocacy, you know, addressing climate change and addressing disaster resilience. And these include the California Environmental Justice Alliance, as well as some of our state programs, including the Listo California, which is a preparedness program focusing on our most vulnerable and low income communities here in California. And then nationally, we have alliance of different frontline organizations working at the intersection of climate justice and social, climate change and social justice, including the Climate Justice Alliance, as well as the Indigenous Environmental Network. And we are now setting ourselves up for the 2021 wildfires. How can we continue to educate our funders around social justice and disaster resilience? And how can we work with our government partners better? And I just wanted to close out is, is, it is I was talking to Lori right before this, it is so difficult. We are, we are trying to pivot philanthropy to do something that they are not used to do. Philanthropy has always been really good in funding for direct relief, disaster relief. But now we are changing culture. We will be saying, yeah, you may, you, it might be much more strategic to use your dollars in investing in mitigation preparedness. It may not be sexy, but it does so much more good for local and frontline communities. So, um, I have a few things. Um, this is going to quickly, um, since I'm running a little bit out of time for academics, for all of you, here are some of the questions that I'm constantly um, grappling with. If you have any research or if you're doing research on this, I would love to hear from you. What is the business case for prioritizing hazard mitigation, specifically in BIPOC communities? And what kind of modifications that we need to change in our state and federal policies so we can have more equitable resource allocation. More research around the intersection of climate adaptation, disaster mitigation, and a whole host of issues facing our BIPOC communities, including health, criminal justice reform, gender inequality, workforce development, and affordable housing. And all the different types of market mechanisms that we can advance both racial and equity racial and economic equity in climate and disaster resilience. And finally, you know, how do we leverage, best leverage different types of funding to advance mitigation. For practitioners, there is a link on the website. I recommend you just skim through the first 10 pages of this, is how can you can integrate equity into your programs, policies, or whatever that you're doing you know, including developing equitable goals, vision values to developing an equitable process for community engagement, centering equity in your implementation, as well as having an equitable evaluation. And again, I encourage you to ask yourself again, these three questions as you move forward to whatever you do, you know, after this webinar is how does racial disparities standing in the way of what you do and understanding what are the forces behind these disparities that, and that perpetuate them. And with that, I think I have 10 minutes for this. So uh, Laurie, apologize, I'm running over a little bit. No, Alan, no apologies at all. Thank you so much for the presentation and the cornucopia of 
information that you shared with us. Um, we do have some questions that have come in through the chat and the Q&A. So I'm gonna work through a couple in the chat and then I'm gonna move over to the Q&A. Um, so thank you so much for that. And um, I promise you that our, our participants would be very engaged and indeed they were. And so I'm gonna start actually with a question that um, Stephen Mack asked after you, um, I, I think it was in the portion where you were talking about some of Junia and Jim's research. So he wanted to know, will wealthier people with insurance have essentially two recovery in so income sources? So do they have their insurance plus federal aid? And so is part of that inequity that you showed, is it part of it that wealthier people, they have both the insurance and they're getting the federal aid. And then he says, is part of more disaster aid going to wealthier people because they lost structures that are liable to be worth more that to start with. And this also right. relates to the redlining impact and so forth. Okay, so can you- Complex question. Ahead? So I'm not gonna go, I think there are probably more, you know, knowledgeable people about the ins and outs of the individual assistance from FEMA. But I think is, what do you think about this? It is, um, who actually are more homeowners, more likely to be homeowners in the US, white folks, I think is because of a legacy of the redlining where, you know, because of redlining, you know, it has tremendous devastation on the accumulation of wealth and access to accumulation of wealth here in the country. So that black and brown people are less likely to be able to, you know, get a loan, you know, to buy a house outside of the neighborhood, as well as in Junior's um, paper is that, you know, those who are actually, you know, for, you know, red line, historically red line neighborhoods, their value of the homes are actually much lower than those that are non red lined. So that even if you're a homeowner, if you you own a home in a historically red line neighborhood, your home value is so much lower if you are, you know, if you own a home in a white, more predominantly white neighborhood. So that when you have insurance, you actually get money, most of them, you know, if you have house, you know, homeowner insurance, you actually, you know, um, get money back as well as, you know, if you're able to apply for FEMA insurance, you know, whatever, you know, FEMA aid, whatever that is not covered. Um, I'm pretty sure there'll be some people are able to discuss that, able to supplement that. But I think you have to think about how does that insurance work? for those who are homeowners. And for renters, many of the renters, they rent because first of all, I rent, I cannot afford a home here in the California, but do I have home, you know, renter's insurance? Yes, I have renter's insurance, but many renters, especially black and brown communities who are living on paycheck to paycheck, renter's insurance is the last thing that they think about. So that they already, you know, not only do they live in a more at risk area, but then when a disaster hits, they don't have insurance because, you know, they, you know, this is nothing, you know, this is something that is not on the mind. And I think it is that way of, it's, the idea is, is things just got perpetuated, you know, one thing over the other. And then as you're going through a disasters, who have access to aid is really important. If you are thinking about, put yourself, if you are like a single mom having three jobs, especially if you're a woman of color, for example, having three jobs. The last thing is you have your disasters. You may probably move to some place. You kind of like, you know, you move your kids somewhere, you know, safer, you know, you may be trying to find a place that, you know, um, rent someplace else, but then, you know, you're living on page to paycheck, you know, do you live in a shelter? Do you go to a shelter or do you, you know, find someone? So you I think it's much more complex than that because there's a lot of social capital involved um, in supporting low-income communities as well as those impacted by disasters, especially for low-income community, you know, person, if they're impacted by disaster, if they relocate, they relocate, it costs money to relocate, and then they also lose all the social support, you know, whether they'll be family members, you know, and things like that. So that, you know, and then if you're going to, if you have three jobs, how are you going to have find time to apply for aid? I think that's the key thing is it's so difficult to navigate the aid process. It is especially in a disaster situation. So I think it is a much more complex that I can uh, I can talk more and more about this, but it is um, a lot of barriers, 
you know, um, people of color in disasters face a lot more barriers in accessing aid than those who are homeowners or who are white. Thank you, Alan. And related to that, Max had a question about, um, can you elaborate more on where you're seeing the issues with FEMA aid and its ability to address rather than amplify disparities? And so is it specifically at that individual assistance level, level at the cost recovery, or are you referring to mitigation right. initiatives and so forth? Thank you. Right. You know, if I can change the in, you know, individual assistance, I would say, you know, like, um, lift the um, everyone who is impacted by disasters will be eligible, whether you are, you know, you have a legal status or illegal status, <laughs> immigration status. I, I think it does will do a tremendous good. Um, and I think it also looks into, you know, the process of aid, getting aid. Um, you know, sometimes aid, you, there's a lag time. So, you know, where can, how can we speed up the process? And I also know that, you know, for, you um, the community development block grant, you know, disaster recovery, usually those money going into recovery process as well as mitigation process takes a time, takes probably 18 months from a disaster to, you know, to get in the, by the local government to get the funding. So what happens in between then? So right now, last year, we are trying to um, advocate for permanent reauthorization for that, for the uh, CDBGDR grant so that local governments can always anticipate that they'll get money, um, that they don't have to go through the whole process in a way to speed up that process of getting money out into communities so that those who are most impacted will get the aid that they need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, Sarah Schwartz wanted to know, what about Asian, Asian Pacific Islander, Native American, Indigenous communities? Where are the statistics about these other communities of color? Great question. In data. Um, in data um, I would love to. Um, I would love to have those data as well too. Um, and we are. We know that um, Native Americans, um, um, tribal communities, have you know are even more disproportionately impacted by disasters. And we are here in California, we have over two dozen or three dozen, you know, tribal, you know, recognized tribal community reservations and communities, tribes here in California. So we are looking into like how we can support them. And then unfortunately, even philanthropy, less than 1% of philanthropic dollars go into tribal community. So we have so much more to do about that. But if you have data on it, I would love to have them. <laughs> <laughs> All of us, yes, thank you. Yes. And we have time for one more question, which is so in your wheelhouse, Ellen. So Diamond wanted to know, how can a resource giving organization, whether public or private, philanthropic, um, better provide channels of access to BIPOC grassroots organizations? Right. First, I think is really thinking internally. What policies, processes, um, our decisions being made. I think is we are looking into who are making those decisions. Um, are those with different lived experiences? Um, are those coming from, are those decision makers coming from, you know, um, historically marginalized communities? Because when you make decisions, whether you make decisions on resource giving or policies or programs, when you have someone with a different, perspective, especially someone who is black or brown, they come with a very different perspective and they make decisions that supports everybody. Um, and I think that is really key, is really championing um, BIPOC individuals in leadership roles and in decision-making tables. Alan, thank you so much for this presentation and to everyone out there. I know we did not get to all of your questions and comments, but we know, know we, what we're going to do, we're going to um, send them to Alan and get a written response for those we didn't get to, and we will post them on the Hazard Center website. And Alan, we could spend all day with you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. And we hope this is just the beginning of a much longer conversation, connection, and collaboration with our whole community. And so thank you so much.
And in just our moments remaining, just a big reminder to everyone out there, please visit the Hazard Center website under the trainings tab if you're interested in getting your um, one hour towards your continuing education training. And also we wanted to ask all of you to please save the date for our December 8th, 2020, our final one of this year, uh, Making Mitigation Work webinar, where we will be looking at opportunities and challenges associated with implementing buyouts. And we have a fabulous panel of top researchers and practitioners who are gonna be tackling another thorny issue with us next month. But for this month, please everyone join me in a big virtual round of applause for Alan Kwok, Philanthropy California, and all of your partners. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Laurie. And thank you for Natural Health Research Center for having me. Much appreciated. Thank you. Have a beautiful day. You too. And thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.